For six weeks, millions of people have been riveted by the Casey Anthony murder trial. And then yesterday came the shocking verdict. Talk to me a little bit about that media frenzy that was whipped up. And, you know, you said junk legal analysis that we saw on a lot of cable channels in the States. Uh, what kind of a factor was that in all of this? Good morning, Seamus is off. I'm Todd Vander Hayden. All the waiting, all the anticipation is finally over. At midnight, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hollows Part 2 premiered worldwide. You saw it. I did. It's always fun to do the improv. You got it. Definitely. First, though, the story we've all been talking about for about nine days now here in the media, probably you at home as well, Will and Kate's big trip to Canada. Tell me a little bit about that, because I know there's frustration and anger in terms of the process and the bureaucracy involved in this. Where does the rebuilding process stand right now, and, and what's the message you want to get out there about that? For months now, Britain has been embroiled in a hacking scandal. It started with politicians and celebrities. Actor Hugh Grant has accused the news of the world of listening in to private messages. But now the tabloid is accused of hacking into and deleting the phone messages of murder victims, soldiers killed in action, and the grieving families of terror attack victims. We'll find out why this scandal could end up affecting Britain's Prime Minister. Now, there's also talk, though, that this sort of thing is, is kind of common in the industry, and I'm wondering whether journalists uh, in the tabloid industry in the UK are taught how to do this as part of their training, uh, and are they under a lot of pressure to come up with results for their bosses in terms of breaking stories? They certainly are under a lot of pressure. Arab uprisings continue to rock the Middle East. It's been two and a half months or so since the government in Tunisia fell, followed by Egypt. Now NATO is in Libya. Syria is in turmoil, along with Yemen and Bahrain. The list goes on. And let's focus, though, I'm looking, you know, at The Economist, for example, saying, where does this end? And talking about, you know, the situation in Libya. And, and nobody really knows where this ends, specifically in the Libyan case. Uh, we see now the rebels today being pushed back. The battle for Libya is heating up. American, British, French fight hitting targets throughout Libya. Meantime, U.S. President Barack Obama says NATO will take command of the entire Libyan operation starting tomorrow. Obama made the announcement in a televised address last night. He defended American military action in the region, saying it was necessary to prevent a potential massacre by Libyan dictator Muammar Gaddafi. Tell me a little bit about the wider sense. We know this is a region in revolt. It goes way beyond Libya. We're talking yes. about uh, Libya. We're talking about Yemen. We're talking about Bahrain. Even some protests going on now in Syria. Are we looking at an Arab Spring, so to speak? I think so. Even I would call it more than an Arab Spring. I think that is a, it's a second wave of Arab awakening. Meantime, the situation in Syria is going from bad to worse. Thousands of pro-democracy protesters took to the streets again today in many cities. Despite a brutal crackdown that's killed an estimated 850 people, demonstrators are keeping up the pressure. The Syrian dictator Bashar Assad is expected to announce greater political freedoms in the next 24 hours amid a week of protests and some deadly shootings in Syria as well. Khalid Madani from Miguel is back with us here in studio today. We've seen the situation in Tunisia and in Egypt and in Libya and now in Syria and I, and I want to get your take on, on what you think is happening there uh, and whether these the, this opening by Assad is, is really legitimate. I want to ask you a question about hypocrisy here for a second. The, the idea that it's okay for the West to sort of support revolution or uprisings in Egypt and Tunisia and Libya but taking a much less direct approach when it comes to Saudi Arabia or or Bahrain or Yemen because there are sort of geopolitical interests there. Is it sort of a bit of a contradiction there? Absolutely, absolutely, of course. Western Western positions are taken according to, uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, according to the interests of the West. If you are uh, Gaddafi at this point, what kind of options does he have left? Well, you see, the way he thinks is a different way that you and I could think. Tens of thousands of people, mainly children, have died in the past five weeks. Hundreds of thousands more are at risk. We talked about there being a drought, of course, which is an environmental thing, but, but part of it as well has been man-made in the sense that the Somali government collapsed 20 years ago, and now there's this al-Qaeda-linked group that, that denied humanitarian groups access to parts of Somalia uh, that could have prevented this, or at least mitigated it a little bit. Uh, yeah, this is a very complex uh, situation. It's and after almost a decade and the loss of more than 150 soldiers, the current mission is set to end in June. From there, the federal government says the mission will change from combat to support and training. And so we wasted a lot of the public's uh, patience on this, and that means that we have to uh, ramp down our expectations a little bit. And we 
Uh, Steve, let me just jump in. Once sure. Canada pivots towards this more of a training and support role come the summertime, I'm curious what that means exactly and whether this is, you know, to a certain extent a bit of a fudge because they're not going to be out of danger. Mm -hmm. Casualties are still possible, mm -hmm. maybe even probable, regardless of, of where they are in Afghanistan or what they're mm -hmm. doing exactly. They're still going to be targets. You know, sometimes it seems like this is the whole thing is turned into the best we can hope for mm -hmm. in a series of worst-case scenarios. <laughs> Hello and welcome. I'm Todd Vander Hayden. Thousands of people are focusing on one priority today, getting home in time for Christmas. As CTV News first learned, Prime Minister Stephen Harper is set to shuffle his cabinet this afternoon. The changes will likely be minor. A security officials saying this is, uh, quote, indefinite. Uh, you know the TSA has come under a lot of fire over its pat-down procedures in the past couple of months, being too intrusive, causing delays. And now passengers have got something else to deal with on both sides of the border. To our top story, military efforts are in high gear to get supplies to the Australian city of Rockhampton, where floodwaters have cut off all but one access route. Now, I just want to expand a little bit about that walkabout in Ottawa's Byward Market, because this was just such a great example of Barack Obama's style. Uh, anyone who's ever been to Ottawa knows the Byward Market is very popular with tourists, sort of an eclectic mix of shops and bakeries. As the country appears to be caught in a rut, yesterday's cover of the Journal de Montréal is the decline of the American empire. One of our political analysts joins us now from downtown Montreal, Graham Dodds, a prof at Concordia, himself from Pennsylvania. So Graham, there seems to be sort of a malaise. It's a big mess. Uh, people are calling this a failure of leadership by Obama. Is that a fair judgment? The leader of the New Democratic Party, Jack Layton, is here in studio with us today. Looking at the papers today, I'm wondering, are you ready to move into 24 Sussex? <laughs> well, we're certainly ready to get the job done. Well, the Bloc Québécois have been wiped out, unlikely to even make it to official party status. It's unbelievable to imagine.